The traditional cold calm of Canada has been shattered by a meddling American who for two years has been tracking down alleged Nazi war criminals living in Canada. People who with their own hands killed Jews, shot them, stabbed them, beat them to death. It's a remarkable story that somebody can walk across the border and find war criminals that our Royal Canadian Mounted Police have been unable to find for 50 years. Only now, a full half century after the end of World War II, are we beginning to learn the truth about some bitter realities hidden from public view back then. First, that the Swiss did very profitable business with the Germans during that brutal war and deprived the Nazis' Holocaust victims and their families of their rightful property. Well, now comes Canada's dark secret. The Canada's government apparently welcomed thousands of Nazi war criminals into Canada at war's end, where they have lived comfortably and peacefully ever since. And only now has Canada begun to acknowledge its complicity and its shame. The traditional cold calm of Canada has been shaken by, of all things, a meddling American, an unorthodox private detective from Brooklyn named Stephen Rombaum. For two years, mostly at his own expense, he has been tracking down Canada's alleged war criminals after getting their names from the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Jerusalem. The vast majority of the people who we selected from the list of a thousand to pursue are people who, with their own hands, killed Jews, shot them, stabbed them, beat them to death. Now, there are also a number of these war criminals who, while for the most part they may not have pulled the trigger, they coordinated the rounding up and the execution of thousands of Jews. How do you coordinate the rounding up and, and, and murder of thousands of Jews? If you are Antonus Kenstavicius, yep. you are the police chief of the Svensionis region in Lithuania. Ah. Uh, you take groups of uh, Jews about a kilometer away to the Jewish graveyard where a ditch has been dug. You uh, strip them naked. You have them hold hands in groups of ten. And you uh, shoot them in the back with rifles. How do you know all this? Because he confessed. He confessed in detail on tape. At Ken Stavish's home in Hope, British Columbia, these pictures shot by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Rambam says that he secretly recorded Ken Stavish's and his wife describing how they watched the Nazis execute more than 5,000 Jewish men, women, and children. All this is your commando lay down. The Jews will come and lay down. They wouldn't, they wouldn't fight? They just went there? No, 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 and at a certain point in the conversation, he, he looks at me and he says, And I, in November, it was one at last, if they finish, no more Jews. No more Jews. I've been an investigator for about 17, 18 years now, but I've been Jewish all my life. What was your cover? I mean, you didn't c come in and say, I'm a private investigator and I'm going... Right. Trying to find I Nazi didn't war criminals. I'm Steve Rombaum, Jewish guy from New York. Would you care to chat with me about all the Jews you killed? Yeah. Uh, what I did say was I'm Salvatore Romano, and I'm a professor from St. Paul's University of the Americas. We had established the... Uh, St. Paul's University? University of the Americas. Where is that? Uh, Belmapon, Belize. I am the, uh, the faculty, the alumni, and the, uh, the uh, current student body of that university. A non-existent university, and you would say... I'd show them ID. I would tell them that I was writing my doctoral thesis. And with his phony university sweatshirt, yeah, plus an engaging manner, Rambam says that he got many of his suspects to confirm just which units they served in during the war. Rambam was given most of his Nazi names by Ephraim Zurov, who's been tracking war criminals for years at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Jerusalem. Zirov says the Nazis who migrated to Canada were mainly from Eastern Europe, where early in the war they roamed the countryside, murdering Jews. And he alleges that hundreds of these killers are still alive and well in Canada. We're talking basically about Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, who simply were 
collaborators. In those areas, most of the Jews were murdered by the locals. They weren't shipped off to death camps in many cases. These were people who were murdered on the spot. They had infamous murder squads. These are units that, almost on a daily level, carried out the murder of innocent civilians, day in and day out. And there's no question that without their active, willing, and zealous collaboration, the Nazis could never have possibly murdered uh, as many Jews as they did. After World War II came the Cold War, and Canada was worried about communists. The Nazis had fought the communists, so Nazis, even war criminals apparently, had an easy time emigrating to Canada. This, according to Canada's York University history professor, Irving Abella. We know that one of the ways of getting into the country of Canada during this period was by showing the SS tattoo. This proved that you were an anti-communist. And what was the chore of the SS? The SS was obviously the charge with the responsibility of murdering Jews. So there was no question that these were war criminals. Bernard Farber, director of the Canadian Jewish Congress, says once the killers made it to Canada, the government, in effect, let them live there happily ever after. The fact is, Mr. Wallace, the Canadian government never really appeared to give a damn about prosecuting Nazi war criminals, going after them, finding them. They were not interested in it. They had no compunction to trust, say, forget it. We're just, this is not something that we, that we want to get involved. Are you embarrassed about the fact that it was an American private investigator who finally said to the Canadian community, not just the Jewish community, but to the Canadian community, hey, you people are harboring war criminals and you've been doing it for a half a century? Well, frankly, it is embarrassing for everybody. It's embarrassing for the Canadian government. It's embarrassing for the Jewish community. Why didn't we think of it? I, it was too simple. How did you locate these people? I'm sorry to say that we found about a third of them by looking in the phone book. These are people who are not hiding. You mean they're using the, the names that they had in Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine? Quite right. They immigrated to Canada under their real names. They listed their names in the phone book. They bought homes under their own names. It's a remarkable story that somebody can walk across the border with a telephone book and a list and find war criminals that our Royal Canadian Mounted Police have been unable to find for 50 years. Fact is, for most of that time, Canada wasn't even trying to find them. John Sims, the Canadian justice official in charge of prosecuting war criminals, admitted that his government simply was not interested. It's true that Canada did virtually nothing for decades after the Nuremberg trials. Why? I can't really say. I'm not a, I'm not a historian, and, and I'm going to leave it to the historians in your country and mine to, to debate that. Historian Irving Abella says he got the answer from Pierre Trudeau, who was for 15 years Canada's prime minister. He said the reason that he and his government did not go after war criminals, and they had been lobbied by us extensively, was because they were afraid of exacerbating relationships between Jews and Eastern European ethnic communities, that we were bringing old country battles into Canada. And so he didn't do anything, and he admitted it quite openly. But finally, ten years ago, after a national commission confirmed that Canada was still home for hundreds of war criminals, the Canadians did undertake to prosecute five of them. But so long after the war, with evidence hard to come by, they couldn't get convictions. So now Canada is trying to do what the U.S. has done, deport them. The United States has deported more than 50 Nazis, but in 50 years, Canada has deported just one. This year, John Sims hopes to deport 12 more. 1997 is going to be uh, an important year in which I think considerable progress will be made in ridding this country of, uh, of Nazis. Time is the enemy and proceedings must go quickly if we are to to get results before these men die. But just 11 days ago, the man Steve Rumbaum taped, Anatas Kenstavicius, died at the age of 90. The government had planned to use Rumbaum's audio tape in court. Rumbaum's passion for Jewish causes landed him in prison some 20 years ago because as a member of the Jewish Defense League protesting the Soviet treatment of Jews, he was convicted of transporting bomb-making materials across state lines. Now, because of all the publicity his revelations are receiving in Canada, alleged war criminals there are not talking anymore. Another man on the deportation Hello. list, Eric Tobias, stared out at us but wouldn't come to the door. 
we got a much more hostile reception at the home of an alleged death squad commander, Oscar Perot. The dog took a bite out of my coat before Perot's son, Arville, tied him up. Jewish leaders claim they have eyewitness testimony and other documents that prove Perot led a Latvian murder squad. Perot calls that communist propaganda. So far, at least, he is not on the deportation list. His son insists Perot was a soldier who fought communists, not a commando who killed civilians. And if my father was guilty of something like that, or if there was anything conclusive of something like that, I would personally disown him as a father. Would you really? I would. Another alleged war criminal. The Canadian government says this man walking off a of Florida beach, Helmut Oberlander, was a translator for an SS unit that killed thousands of Jews. When he left Canada for a Florida vacation, the U.S. threw him out. We do not wish to talk to you. We don't wish to talk to you. Oberlander went back to Canada. He wasn't home when we tried to see him in a comfortable suburb outside Toronto, but his neighbors, Helga Whiten and her husband John, a professor of German, say their government should leave the Oberlanders alone. Well, they're fine people. Are they? They're very quiet. And been nice neighbors for about 28 years. So nice that the Whitens don't believe Oberlander could really be a war criminal. What evidence do they have uh, to, to paint him with this horrible guilt? I mean, that was quite a long time ago. I don't see what justice is served by, by kicking him out of the country. I, mm. I just don't see that. It must be difficult for his neighbors to, to believe that a man they have seen as, as a neighbor uh, could have uh, done these heinous, terrible acts when he was a young man uh, during the war. But the fact that he did do them during the war means that we can't forget. We cannot ignore that. We must go after him. Canada is also going after Conrad Kalej for allegedly murdering Jews in Latvia. The United States deported Kalej in 1994, so he moved up to Canada. Incredibly, he moved into an apartment building that was known to have many Jewish residents, including three Holocaust survivors. Vera Peter spent seven months in Auschwitz. When she read in the paper that she's living next to an accused Nazi war criminal, she was stunned. I was first in, in a shock. And all of a sudden, there is this man who comes from the past and all the unhappy memories of a horrible past of the Holocaust came back. Why would he want to live among Jews? He just thought that this was a very nice shield for him to be... This, this to is, be among this Jews? Is, this, this is something which, of course, is just a gut feeling. Kalesh is fighting deportation and, like the others, he tries to avoid cameras. Why is he covering his face then? Because I don't like to see your face. That's what, all of your faces. You, you look very stupid, all of them. Another deportation target, Joseph Nemsela, blames his legal problems on the Jews. They will never change. Who's they? Jews. Jews will never change. There are those who say, come on, 50 years later. These are old men by now. We hear it all the time. We ought not reward longevity. I don't think they deserve our sympathy. I think if we look at what they did to the elderly, that's perhaps the best argument for the efforts to bring them to justice. What we have to clearly understand is that the victims of the Nazi Holocaust never lived to a ripe old age. But if the allegations are true, the victimizers still living in Canada have made it into their 70s, 80s and 90s, many without even bothering to change their names. These people aren't afraid. They made the right choice. They came to Canada. Last week, Rabbi Marvin Heyer, Dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, received word from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police that they intend to investigate his list of more than 1,800 former Nazi SS members presently living in Canada who are still receiving their German military pensions. <laughs>